Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this segment of our tonight's fellowship. It has been an amazing fellowship so far. Good food, great company, and now awesome music and worship. Isn't that awesome? Awesome music, great singing. Come on, let's, let's celebrate one more time just because God is good. So tonight, I would like for us to begin by reading from the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And we're going to pray, but we're going to read these verses of Scripture. Maybe actually about three or four verses, but let's start with the one or two. Romans chapter 12. It's a verse of Scripture that we, most of us, I believe, can recite by heart. But today we're going to read it by sight and then believe it by faith. Come on now. I said we're going to read it by sight, so you have to look at it. If you have a Bible on your phone, we're not judging you. You can use that too. Like Sister Barbara, she actually uses the phone light to read the paper Bible. So basically, she's getting a double portion of the anointing. You know, so phone and Bible together. And then occasionally, you can even look on the screen and then you get a triple portion if you want to. Romans chapter 12, verse, it, let me just quickly say this. This is, um, this is not unusual, but this is a request that just came through right now, right now. We, before we read that Romans, we're just going to quickly take a look at Revelations chapter 7. We're going to jump around a little bit and read a couple of scriptures that have been highlighted to me. The Bible says in Revelations chapter 7 that after these things, I know that you were already, you finally found Romans, and then I jumped to Revelations. You can do it again. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Verse 6. Now before we get to verse 6, because I want us to take a look at some of these names and how we need to tap into them. But let's read verse 3. It says, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. One of the things that I want to point out very quickly before we read two more verses from this Revelation 7 is God is a God of order. And he pays attention to details. When they read the manifest of the four angels, the, the manifesto says they held the four winds of the earth. And the thing about the winds of the earth is the winds of the earth, I want you to think about them as smart winds. They, 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 they don't just blow, they blow to announce the time and the seasons. So basically when it's time for harvest, they can bring the wind that aids harvest. When it's time for destruction, they can also be the winds of destruction. So let's not just think about them as the winds of destruction. Okay, because I know some people have the tendency to forget that these are the same winds that the Bible says for your plenty and for your prosperity. Rise up and speak to the wind, commanding the wind to bring you blessings from the north, the east, the west, and the south. And so this time around, we know that Revelation 7 is talking about the fact that these, these winds were bringing destruction. But the order was, first of all, the winds will hit the earth before the sea and then before the trees. <laughs> the Bible says they hold the winds from blowing on the earth, on the sea, and on any tree. 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 Verse 2. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. 
And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. It says, do not harm anything until we have a confirmation that all of the servants of our God have been sealed. In case you didn't notice, I want to call your attention to the fact that when the angel that was coming from the east came, he came to deliver the mind of God concerning his beloved and the order of the instructions of that angel matches the order of the manifesto of the angels holding the wings. The order was consistent. And you know, sometimes you just think, is, well, it's the way people write. People try to be lyrical and poetic. But the Bible says all scripture was given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What this tells me is that God is very much attentive to the order of the fulfillment of prophecy. He pays attention to the fulfillment of the instructions that have gone forth on your behalf. And the reason why we need to know that this order is the same order that Jesus introduced to us is because sometimes we have misjudged our place in the unfolding of events. I remember that growing up and up until recently, most of us were told that we, the saints, will be the ones to be removed from the earth and taken to heaven. That's what most of us grew up thinking. That, oh, we're just, we're going to be removed from here, that the rapture is our exit from this place. But the reality of it is, is actually not in the Bible. It was a made-up story that actually became, that went viral. You understand what I mean? It went viral before social media. Because as I grew older, I was trying to find it in the Word of God, and I just couldn't. All I'm seeing is that the righteous will remain. It is the wicked that will be removed. Jesus says in the parable of the wheat and the tears, when the servants of the landowner were getting jittery and nervous about what would happen to the field, Jesus says, the master, the owner of the field said to his servants, he says, do not bother yourselves. You have done what you are supposed to do. You have sown. He says, when the time comes, the angels of my father will send the reapers into the field. Because the wheat and the tears are so similar and they have grown up together, it takes the kind of attentiveness to details that the angel of the east brings to be able to separate the wheat from the tears. And he said, what's going to happen is that the tears will first of all be removed and burnt with fire while the wheat remains on the field. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. He says, first, gather together the tears and bind them into bundles and burn them. You know, I told you about the gathering together into groups and into bundles. That was what happened in the time of Peleg. When Peleg was born in Genesis eleven seventeen, he was called Peleg because it was the time of the grouping together because heaven was putting a seal on different groups of people because their destinies were already set as a group. You see the bundling together and he says, then later on, you gather the wheat into my barn. You see, whose farm was it? The same person. Whose barn was it? The same person. You see, so when he said, you will gather the tears first. It aligns with everything else in prophecy because prophecy says that a thousand shall fall at your left and 10,000 at your right hand, but only with your eyes shall you behold the reward of the wicked. So when Jesus says in Revelations 20, 21, 22, that I am coming and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to their work. That means when Jesus comes, you and I will still be here while we see him hand over the reward of the wicked. Because your eyes shall behold the reward of the wicked. 
So basically, before the sea is judged, the earth will be judged. Hmm. The earth refers to the general population of humanity because man was formed from the dust of the earth. And I believe that women will be included on that day also. Because some women don't like to think they came from the dust because the Bible says they were formed from the bone of man, which is story for another day. But all humanity, from heaven's perspective, is regarded as dust. And so the judgment which the four winds represent will first of all come to what? The earth. And then it will go to the sea before the trees. The sea represents the world system. Mm -hmm. So we know the system is falling. But it just so happens that the people themselves will be judged before the system is judged. And, I'm, and I want you to just save that at the back of your mind somewhere. So when we get to Revelation chapter 2, I mean Romans chapter 12, we can reference it. Okay, so look at the order of things. What is, where is the wind? First of all, going to hit. It will hit the earth. It will hit the people. The Bible says, in the last days, darkness shall cover the earth. Gross darkness, the people. Because the people are the earth. And so the people will be judged first. They will come under the impact of the judgment of God. The wind that blows will hit people before it hits the system. So the system itself is going to be involved in the judgment of the people. That means the same world system. And this time around, I don't want you thinking about any particular government or any particular corporation, but I want you to think about the collective of what is called the great whore of Babylon. That system that has given of the wine of her immorality to all of the kings of the earth. I want you to think about that system that was established by Nimrod for the purpose of enslaving and hunting down the rest of humanity. Because the Bible says Nimrod was called a mighty hunter. They, were, they called him a mighty man, but before the Lord, he was a hunter. The people regarded him as someone important, but God was like, this one is, is a hunter. He's just going to kill other people. That's what he wants to do. And when you look at the kingdoms that he started, he started those kingdoms. You know, there are so many pers perspectives that the Lord keeps giving me about the kingdoms of Nimrod. I've shared with you about how he started with Babel with, and went to uh, Iraq, Akkad, and then ultimately Shinar. And recently, the Holy Spirit showed to me that what he was doing was he created confusion because he was a hunter. Because when you're hunting animals in the field and you create confusion, you make them come out of their holes, come out of their safe places. You make them come out of the cleft of the rock where they were safe from you. If you can create enough commotion, every single one of them will run into the same place. Isn't that how we hunt? You set the bush on fire over here. You light up some islands and some... You know, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. You... You know, I, I will not apologize for my privilege because indeed I was taken to places of late where I have seen things. I have been given the privilege by God to see to some extent the wickedness that is in the heart of man that has been exploited by Lucifer and his cohorts. Because sometimes even though we call them spiritual wickedness in high places, some of them when they see the wickedness that is in the heart of man, they, 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 they suddenly feel less wicked. Because some men are just mean. But what you do when you're hunting is you start with Babel or Babel, as some Bible school down the road will call it. Because confusion is what, is what Babel means. You confuse and shake everywhere up. And then you start making subtle moves so that the animals don't know that you're coming. Or the prey don't know that you're coming. Ultimately, when it was done, the Lord showed me he was pulling people. You see, when you take a, 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 a stalk of wheat that's already been harvested and you hold it upside down, you see those little seedlings that are on it. That was what Nimrod was pulling. And when I looked closer, there were people. He had a bunch of people and he was dragging them. And I said, where does he take them? He said, keep watching. 
And you know where he took them? He took them to Shinar. He took them to the two rivers because he wanted to begin to prepare them. So he took them to where the water was flowing. You see, we need to think beyond the political parties and the government. Those, those are just, you know, agents. The real system is that which continues to try to shape your thought. The real intention of the world system is to get you drowning in that sea of self-confidence and drowning in that sea of idolatry is to get you to be in a place wherein you feel like you are helpless and you will hold on to anything for dear life. You see, it is part of the strategy of the hunter. So let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. But I tell you one thing, that system will be part of the judgment of the people because it will still be around when the ones who have not learned to call on the name of the Lord will be found in the streets in the day that the angels of the Lord release their wind. You know, the Lord's been saying to us, do not be found on the streets. Don't be found looking for help where there is no help. Don't be found looking for pleasure where there is no pleasure. Do not be found outside of the secret place of the Most High simply because these winds are not nice. And they are no respecter of persons. The only thing that they will, have, that they will bow to is the seal. And that was the reason why God told Moses, tell your brothers and sisters not to go to the streets. Let them remain in their houses because the seal of the blood. You know, Jesus says, I will send to you another comforter. One that is of the same kind. And there was a, there was a hint that he gave to us. He says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So what is the life of, of an animal? The blood. So when they put that blood on their doorposts, they were putting a display of the life of Christ. And so when the Holy Spirit came, that's why the Bible says the Holy Spirit is our seal unto the day of redemption. Because they had the blood for a seal, we have the Holy Spirit for a seal because the blood was the life of Christ and the leading of the Holy Spirit allows you to become the life of Christ. And so the seal is your character. You know, Jesus also told us that the time will come wherein we may become almost indistinguishable from the world. Look at us today. We, are, we, we, I mean, we don't dress too different from the world. If you go out to any one of the atriums in town or any one of the banquet halls where motivational speakers are holding events, they wear, they wear trousers and shirts just like I am. I'm not wearing a robe with a collar that is making it difficult for me to breathe. I'm not carrying a chain around my neck, a cross that is heavy enough for hand robbers to come and snatch the microphone. You know, because some people be doing the most the other day in the name of wanting to look like pastors. They brought gold jewelry and wore crosses and they were philandering on the pulpit and the arm robbers were like, uh, dude, you're doing too much. Let's have some of that. You see? Yeah, so that's why sometimes it's good to be modest so that, you know, the Bible says concerning Jesus that he was made uncomely to behold. Nobody wanted to look at him. His face had been marred. But we, we want to be seen. You know, we're doing the most to be seen, you know? The, the makeup artists walk on the, on, the, on the ministers before they come on stage to the point wherein if those scriptures are not on the screen, they probably don't even remember what they read. Because, ah, oh, anyway, let's not go there. That's a story for another day. Yeah, because, you know, when it, when it comes to making up, you keep looking in the mirror. And the Bible says that he that looks into the mirror goes away forgetting that which he had seen. And so be careful how much you stay into the mirror if the Lord has sent you with a prophetic word so that you don't forget what you have seen. But then that is story for another day. Jesus says when that time comes wherein you look so much like them and they look like you, we're not going to get into the debate of who is copying who. We're just going to figure out a way to identify you. And he said to his disciples, he says, by this shall all men know that you are mine if you have love one for another. And how does that love come? The Bible says the Lord continues to shed abroad our hearts, the, his love by the ministry of his Holy Spirit, the same one who constrains us to love as we are loved. You see, that is the reason why you need the Holy Spirit to love right. Because if you don't have the Holy Spirit, your love will remain sentimental. But when you have the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, to be of truth means to be un biased 
And so your love will be unconditional. It's, it's very mathematical what I'm sharing with you because these things equate one to another. But to go back, let's just quickly go back to the concept of the earth gets judged first. So with our eyes, we shall behold the reward of the wicked because that same experience of the Egyptians is about to come, well, it has begun. It's about to increase on the ones who are not under the seal of God's love, under the seal of the Holy Spirit, under the seal of the life of Christ. And so when those people start to suffer, the system will still be speaking pompous things. When you read the unfolding of the prophecies of John, he talks about the fact that this, the, the system, the beast, continued to speak all kinds of pompous things because even though people were falling like flies, the system continued to believe that it was invincible. Because the whole idea behind the hunting of Nimrod was to be able to empower himself to the point wherein he would avenge their fallen fathers who were fallen angels. So that's why they call themselves the Avengers. You didn't hear that. That's why they call themselves the Avengers. Because they believe that they can defeat that which has already been made eternal. Oh, what does etern eternity mean? Thanos. I think we can start serving the popcorn now because it's kind of like turning into a movie review. But the reality of it is all the signs are out there. The Avengers still believe that they can overrule that which is eternal. And the Bible says that forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your word is eternal. In the Greek language, his word is Thanos. He's eternal. But some people think they can override it. He has already said, after the age of deception, the beast, the false prophet, the antichrist, and the dragon. All of them, all four of them, the four concomitances of evil, will be rounded off and thrown into the lake of fire. But they still believe that they can avoid that sentence because they believe, which is, I mean, at the end of the day, if you know math, you will not be in their situation. Because the math of it is this. God already said that the deceiver himself will be deceived. So the more Satan and his angels try to deceive us, the more deceived they are themselves. That is the reason why it doesn't pay to be a false prophet. Because that which you give is what you will receive. That which you sow is what you will reap. And that is the reason why you find people who have chosen falsehood from the pulpit themselves now saying things that they believe that does not even make sense. And the reality of it is that they're no, they're no longer even trying to deceive people. They've already made money. But now they have just become so deceived themselves that their doctrines are all over the place, straight out of the pit of hell, and they don't even know how to discern. May the Lord help us. The judgment is coming upon the earth. Then eventually we will, we will see the system judged. The Bible says, oh, mystery Babylon, in the day that you fall, you will fall suddenly. Your destruction will come suddenly. And it's going to be a very flamboyant kind of destruction. A destruction that will be seen by all and sundry. That the, mess, the, the merchants of the east will raise their voices and wail and say, Who shall once again buy our merchandise? That is a system. A lot of what is being produced in the world today is being produced under the command of the system to continue to keep the people subservient to God and to money. Uh, for the people who have not come here before, or the people who once came and then disappeared, like Sarah. When I say God and money, I'm talking about G-A-D and M-E-N-I. I believe it's in Isaiah 65, 11, thereabouts. And those are the two gods that the world system forces everybody to worship. God, G-A-D, is the God of material wealth, the God of fortune. Whereas money is the God of the power of obsession. We are obsessed about material things simply because money, spelled M-E-N-I. So again, you know, I told you before, the words that we speak in the English language, they're called spelling because they're used to cast spells. Okay, so basically, 
we have to be careful what things we say. And that's the reason why I encourage everyone who is alive today to speak in tongues. Every born again believer, you need to speak in tongues so that you can undo some of the unsus some of the subtle spells that we cast all the time. You know, I've told you here before, it might sound like a joke, but most of us, all through the week, we are looking forward to the weekend. And when the weekend comes, we are weakened. We're too tired to do anything. And you wake up and you say you're going to a job, and that's why you hate it, because the word job means to be hated. You know, all of these subtleties have been snuck into our very existence, and we don't even know. And so, when you look at the fact that the word God and the word money, which is G-O-D and M-O-N-E-Y, sound exactly like what they have become to many people. To many people within the system, money has become their God. Hmm. I think it's Isaiah 65, 11, because the other day I was trying to tell somebody how to remember where it, said, where it is, because he asked me, a pastor friend, one of our pastor uh, family members asked me, he says, where is this thing found? I said, it's easy to remember it because 11 is the number of destruction, 65, 11. So 6 plus 5 is 11, 11, 11. So to let you know that both of them end in destruction. It's easy to remember. God, G-A-D, and money, they're out to destroy the very soul of humanity by making us the ones who are children of God to whom all things belong to lust after things that perish. It's a scam. It is such a, a, a nasty fraud that you, to whom all things belong, the Bible says in the book of Romans that God who did not withhold Jesus from you, will he not together with him freely give you all things? And the Bible says all things are yours. We have all things and we are bound. And what that means is that even after having had all things, if a need arises, it will be absorbed in the abundance. That is what it means to have all things and to abound. So that nothing catches you on a west. But then somehow the system makes us to lust after material things. Let me quickly read that Isaiah 65 to you. And then we can move on. Because I believe it's going to be a useful tool. If you will take it and meditate on it, it will bless you even more. Isaiah chapter 65. Verse 11. What does it say? He says, but you are those who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for what? For God, which is the God of what? Of fortune. And who furnish a drink offering for who? For many. And money is what? Let me tell you more verbatim what money is. Anybody wants to know? So money means fate or fortune. But the combined sense of the fate or fortune is many people come to believe that their fate is determined by how much they have. So they start obsessing over things because they believe that the sufficiency of their lives depend in the abundance of the things that they acquire. You see, that is the reason why people don't ever have enough money. Mm. Mm. Anyway, uh, that is, like I said, for you to continue to meditate on. But you see, the sea will be judged. And who's going to be left after the wind touches the earth? The people that are forsaking God. He says, all of you people who forsake me, right? And I'm going to tell you exactly what I mean by the Lord was pointing this way, not to y'all, to people. He says, you who forsake me, he said, I'm coming for you. He said, because you know what, he, you know what the Lord was saying here? The Lord was talking about the fact that what they do is, let's, let's, let me show you two things very quickly. I'm trying to get away from this thing so that we can continue with other things, but it's, um, it's just uh, bubbling in my spirit. So let's read that Isaiah 65 again. And I'm going to read from my Bible here so that you know that it was not a message that I'm reading from my phone. Now come with me to Isaiah chapter 65, verse what? 
Verse 11. And it says, but you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain. The significance of forgetting the holy mountain is what? When it comes to the secrets of divine sustenance. You know, many people follow after money because they think that their fate is determined by their fortune. Right? Another interpretation of the word money, I remember now, money refers to the quantity represented by number. So when people wanted to determine the extent of a fortune, they asked for the number. They tell you that, man, that guy is loaded. You'd be like, how much money does he have? If you go to search people's names on Google, it's one of the first things that will come. If you type John Johnson, it will say worth. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, you, you search for most people's names and it will say it's net worth. I think I may need water today just so that I can surprise some people. They will say net worth because they want to quantify. Thank you, Big Mace. I appreciate that. Because they want to quantify and then know the extent of that person's dependability or availability. Praise the Lord. So here's the deal. The Bible says you will only fall for God and money if you forget your heavenly father's holy mountain. You know why? <coughs> the holy mountain of God is a representation of the immense wealth of your heavenly father. The Bible says your heavenly father owns a cattle upon a thousand hills. Your father. And so if you remember his holy mountain, and the Bible says that the mountain of the Lord's house, which is the holy mountain, is going to be upon the mountains. That means you gather all of these thousands and thousands of mountains. And when the Bible says the Lord owns a cattle upon a thousand hills, it's not just talking about 1,000. The word thousand derives from the word abundant or numerous. So your heavenly father owns all those things. If you would not forget, you will not fall for the trap of God and money. Pray for me, I have a nasty cough, but I will still preach. Mm. Praise the Lord. Because the Bible says, what shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulations, trials, sickness, nothing. At the end of the day, don't worry, I'm well rested. The cough just refused to go, but I'm well rested. So, <coughs> before you rebuke me too harshly. <coughs> now, look at what the Bible says about God. It says, you prepare a table for God. For the God of fortune, you prepare a table. You know what it means to prepare a table? Most of the work that we do, we do on a table. So basically, most of us, everything that we think about, that we plan, all of our ambitions, all of our plans and projects is always centered around what you will get instead of what you can give. I've told you several times before that if we would only wake up and say that we're going to work because we have something to give, most of us would be better rewarded than going there because we want something from God, the God of fortune. <coughs> the second thing, and we're going to move on from there, is that you pour out or you furnish a drink offering for many. Jesus says his life is like a drink offering. I think Paul said the same, poured out. So when you see the Bible talking about the drink offering, he's talking about the willingness of a man to give his life in exchange for something else. And this was how we were trapped into the world system, by getting us to the point wherein we're willing to give the best of our time to money. Do you know that there are several people who will choose to go and take that extra shift than spend time with their loved ones, or even go to the house of God, or even develop their own inner man by paying attention to the word of God? And when you ask them, do you really need that money? They're like, well, you know, you just never know. Well, maybe you never know, but I know that there is a mountain. And that holy mountain has everything that I need. Everything has to be done 
in moderation. I think Charles knows the secret. What I wasn't doing it. So let's see if coffee works. If it works, then we know that you know. When we were little, when my brother asks me anything, I would just give him the answer. And he would say to me, you're guessing. I said to him, am I right or wrong? If I'm right, then I didn't guess. That means I know. So if you're right, then you, you know. But in any case, we're going to move on from there so that we can go back to these uh, three elements before we read Romans chapter 12. Do not give the best of your soul. Do not pour your wine offering. To the obsession for adding numbers to numbers when it comes to material possession. Paul says, I have come to learn to live with and to live without. We need to be able to live with and without because the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So we need to start to redeem ourselves from where we had sold ourselves out into, into prostitution. We need to redeem ourselves. Well, okay, there's a competition going on now to see who, who is going to solve this problem. Whether it is Charles coffee or my wife's uh, whatever this is. It looks like it's a syrup, mint or something like that. Okay, alrighty. So if you are for Charles, can I see your hand if you are for my wife? Okay, so Lady Rose, you know I haven't got the fingernails for these things. Okay, I, I, yeah. If you can. Adi, that's not funny. I can literally assemble a computer from dust, but I can't open up a... <laughs> yeah, you may, you may, once you overcome that, let me know. Anyway, I want to quickly touch on something. When the system is done getting judged, so the wind comes to the, what first? Marianne? What does it come first to? The earth. Okay, very good. And then Shayla? The sea, and then Patricia, we haven't said that one, so you're good. The trees, we've, we've read it, but we haven't re revised it, so I, I, I'll give you a pass. But what are the trees? Who are the last people to brave the wind? We, because the Bible says that we are like green olive trees in the house of the Lord. We are the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. The Lord causes the wind to blow so that he can show the flimsiness of those people who put their trust in material things of the earth. The Lord causes the wind to blow to expose the flimsiness of the system that was initiated by a blood-sucking demon. So that at the end of the day, he would allow the same four winds to hit you who is the planting of the Lord that he may show forth the praises of him who has called us out of the darkness into the marvelous light. The wind is coming for your sake. To reveal that you are worthy of that eternity that he paid so dearly for. Because remember, the ancient ones have gone to challenge God on, at his throne. They have gone to him. And the day that they went, David was there. When they said, who is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you will visit him. Because they knew God had a plan to come and dwell amongst men. And they were like, why would you go? And live amongst human beings. You will find this in, in I believe, uh, Psalms chapter 8. Why would you go? And God is like, if only you would wait, then you will see the investment that I have in this man. And so God is not just going to let us have a, a free pass to say, oh, <laughs> they're my children, they can come in. No. Well, Jesus says, the ones that overcome alone will receive a reward. God is not looking for weaklings because that is one way by which he will know the ones who are of him and the ones who are not. Because if you were truly made of the same fabric as the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are truly born of God is what I mean, you will be able to withstand in the day. And that is the reason why all of these things are happening in the world. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. So far, Charles' coffee is winning because I haven't had that thing. And I've stopped coughing. Okay. Oh, shaka boomba. My wife says that was delivered by an angel. Mm. We shall see. All righty, God is good. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I've learned from, I mean, I've learned a lot of things from my wife and 
You know, sometimes I tell you, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I pretend like I'm just that right. You know, there, there, will be, there were days way back when wherein if I wasn't feeling well, I wouldn't want to do anything. And one day my wife said to me, are you feeling better now? After I got off a phone call where I was very excited, I said, actually, not, not quite. I said, but you were screaming and shouting just now. I said, yeah, because they were telling me that the money was ready. And so my wife was like, okay. So when it's about money, you can get up and be excited and be talking on the phone. I was talking on the phone. I was pacing back and forth. Oh, absolutely. I'll be there by Monday. I'll take the first flight. I'll be out there as long as the contract is signed. Uh, can I get an advance payment? I was doing this and that. And so since then, my wife would always chip that in. If some days I'm like, oh, I don't feel too good. I don't want to go to church today. And she'd be like, do I make up a phone call that some money is available somewhere? Will that make you jump up? You know, so it started like a joke. She would tease me. But the reality of that is that I'm like, this little cough is not going to stop me from going to somewhere where they say, come and take money. If, if they're not happy that I'm coughing, if they think they're going to catch something, they should wear a mask. I can wear a mask. Whatever it is, let's just talk business. So I'm like, okay, if I'm going to go do work, then is this not my glorious work? You know what? Come on. So I, I say that so that you don't take me to be an extremist, someone who would not even take a break on the day that he has a cough. No. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. no. I must work the work of him who has sent me while it is day. For the night is only around the corner when no man can work. And when that time comes, I can choose to pull my feet up and then let angels find me. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Revel Romans chapter 12. I keep saying revelations, and I know why, but let's go to Romans chapter 12. He says, I beseech you, verse 1, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Somebody needs to check on Z afterwards. Do we know what's, where she's at? Oh, she's teaching today. Okay, all righty, God is good. Because as soon as I started reading this, I'm like, this is a Z kind of scripture. I knew she was going to love it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not... Be conformed to this word. Someone says, and do not. Be conformed to this word. So the and, there means you have to first of all do the upper one. And then you can be one that does not conform to the world. You see, if your intention and your dedication is to present your bodies unto God, a living sacrifice, it becomes difficult for you to then, at the same time, be conformed to the world. They're mutually exclusive. So that is the reason why Paul started by saying, present your bodies unto God, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Because once you're acceptable to God, you cannot be acceptable to the world. But if you have not yet sought, you know, I told you about three weeks ago that there are two kinds of approvals. The Bible says, observe to show yourselves approved. The old King James English says, study to show yourselves approved. So some people just study the Bible, they just read the Bible, and they think that's what it means. That's why they still behave like unbelievers. That's why they're still unforgiving and ungrateful. The word study there doesn't just mean to read your Bible. It means be circumspect, observe, be diligent, are dedicating yourself to the service that you have been called to. That's what it means. So when you observe to show yourselves approved unto God, because I have heard people say in this grace revelation generation that, oh, I am already approved by God. I don't have to worry. Yes, you and I both. We are both approved by God, but now we need to be approved unto God. <laughs> To be approved by God is to have you unconditionally qualified for grace. But now that you have received that grace, what are you going to do with it? 
Will you continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says, God forbid, Romans chapter 6. We don't continue in sin that grace may abound. We have received grace so that we can now begin to do the good works. We have now received grace so that we can never say no to sin because how can we continue to be a slave to that which we are dead unto? The Bible says, do you not know that you are a servant to the one that you obey? If I keep obeying the dictates of sin, then I am a servant to sin. Am I then truly free? Have I not taken the freedom, the liberty wherein I have been set free and made it subject again to the shrine of unrighteousness? That is the reason why you and I, first of all, need to seek to be acceptable unto God, to be approved unto God. And God is not asking you to impress him. He's just saying, be holy. Holiness is not sanctification. Holiness is not works of righteousness. The word holiness means the purity of character. The word holiness means the purity of character. That is why God is called holy, holy, holy. Because that means he's the holiest. The, the tri repetition there is the Jewish, I mean the, the Greek way of, of representing a superlative adjective. To show that it is not just holy or holier, but this one is the holiest. That's why they say it three times. So if I want to describe Adi in, in the old Greek way of literature, I would say tall, tall, tall Adi is. Because he's the tallest amongst us. The other day I thought about carrying out deliverance on him just to make sure that he's not from Jericho. Just to make sure that this one is not one of the descendants of Gath, the brothers of Goliath, because, I mean, I've been around for almost two decades before he was born, and I'm not as tall as he is. What is he doing? And I'm, I'm not jealous. I, I'm, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but tall, tall, tall he is because he's the tallest. So holy, holy, holy is the holiest. But the Bible says, be holy as he is holy. So how can I be holy as he is holy? You know how? By, by making myself subject to love. Anything that you do out of love is holy. Because when you love, you are patient. When you love, you are kind. When you love, you're not, you're not easily irritated. Because the Bible says love is not irritable. When you love, you suffer long when people are doing the same thing over and over again because love is long-suffering. The totality of the fruits of the Spirit has been evident by the attributes of love is what holiness is. It's not when you tie a scarf around your ear that you don't even hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. That is not holiness. That is Bodily exercise. And the Bible says bodily exercise profits but little. But godliness is profitable. What is godliness? Godliness is constant commitment to being holy. All right? So you may have to listen to this again so you can. Some of these definitions have helped me a great deal and I believe they're going to help you too. So when I say that I'm living a godly life, it means that I am committed to constantly being holy, to constantly being of a pure character, a character that is born out of the love of God that is without blemish because that love of God was seen in the person of Christ and it was called the lamb that was without blemish. So we need to know that the secret to not falling for the antiques of the world, this, the way by which we don't end up conforming to the world is by first of all making sure that our main objective in life is to be holy as God is holy. To love always. Because love is selfless. And when you can live a selfless life, you have immunity to greed. Because the people who are greedy are selfish. They want everything for themselves. I mean, you have to be extremely greedy to become a multi-billionaire. Because that is too, a lot of money for one person to keep. You understand what I mean? And someone says, oh, it's because you don't have money. But I have Jesus. So I have what is more, and I'm still able to give out of what I have. Silver and gold I may not have, 
But what I have, I give. And what I have is more precious than silver and gold. And if I can still give you a little bit of that, Jesus, then you know that I love you. Come on, God is good. And the Bible says in verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What I really want to draw out today is do not be conformed to this world. You see, the reason why the world is so in your face, the reason why the world, the world system is the way it is, is also for your sake. Because if we don't have a standard defined and, and called the world, some of us may not know when we become worldly. Okay, I'm going to say that again. You see, the world is the way it is, so that you can know what not to be. The Bible says, do not be conformed. You see, many of us, while we're still babes, we don't know what we should do. We only recognize what we shouldn't do. Hmm. When you have a child, what do you keep telling them most of the time? Don't do that. Stop that. Don't climb that. Don't, don't stand on that thing. Because they don't know it's for sitting, even though they see everybody sitting on that chair all the time. Ariel was almost six years old before she knew the couch was for sitting. She thought it was a trampoline. Because she would bounce from one to the other. You understand what I mean? And that's why, that's what it means to be a babe, to be a child. So ultimately what God wants you to do is to grow and know what you must do. And what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to be acceptable to your heavenly father by being holy. But God knows that until we reach maturity, we may not know to do what we're supposed to do. That is the reason why he allowed the world system to exist so that you see what you are not supposed to be. If you don't know how to be godly or how to be holy just yet, no problem. Just do one thing to start with. Don't be like the world. It's simple. <laughs> don't be like what? Don't be like the world. So if you see people in the world worrying, just don't worry. If you see people in the world being selfish and greedy, just be selfless and generous. Because it is easier for children to hear, excuse me, and to commit to memory what they are not supposed to do rather than what they are supposed to do. So I've told you what you're supposed to do. The Bible tells us what we're supposed to do, but it then goes on to say, do not be conformed to this world. So when you see the extent to which the people of the world are becoming confident and bold in their immorality, it is not supposed to drain you. It is not supposed to make you frustrated. It is not supposed to make you beg for Jesus to come every time you see some new foolishness on television. I say, Jesus, you better come now because I'm not sure how much of this foolishness I can take. Come, Jesus. No, you see all those things so that you know very clearly what you are not supposed to be. When you see people on the train, on the bus, on the plane, defending their political party shamelessly and in utmost confusion, sounding like babes, immediately you know that, okay, I'm not supposed to do that because I'm not supposed to be conformed. And that leads you closer and closer to the point wherein you don't have to see evil to know how to do right. Hmm. God said to Adam and Eve, he says, you shall not eat out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil. You shall not. Because what it does, it, it sucks you to the densest part of the fruit, which is the evil. Evil is very heavy. Evil, darkness is heavy, very dense. You know, I was watching the documentary yesterday wherein a scientist has now been able to prove that outer space is actually not a vacuum, that it is actually very dense water. And I'm like, oh, I did like this. Because I'm like, wait a minute. Genesis says that he separated the waters from the waters. The waters above, he called. The waters beneath, he called. This, 
Mm. So I'm like, yeah. I said, these people are slowly backtracking. Because physics tells you that if there is abject darkness that is void of light, it will be so dense that whatever comes into that volume will immediately be liquefied under the pressure of emptiness. And so it can never be a vacuum. We knew that for the longest, but they kept, they kept saying all kinds of foolishness. I've been telling you, this is where I will be by the grace of God. Maybe not in this building, maybe in another. But I will be here when I behold the reward of the wicked. When God starts to expose them, excuse me, for all their lies. I'm so excited. This microphone needs to be sanitized afterwards. You have just been spitting into it. Sorry, that's, that, I'm just letting Alan know so that we don't hand it to another person because I, I, I want to keep my own speech to myself. I'm sorry. Let's break bread. And I'm going to tell you one or two more things and then we can, we can close. You see, folks... What God is letting us know, thank you, sir, is that we don't have to be in a hurry to get out of here. This place belongs to us. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 5, I say it again to you, that blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But the trouble that many of us have is that we don't want the earth as it is because it's been ruined in so many ways. Animals have been poisoned by the disobedience of Adam and Eve to the point where some of them are poisoned to the point of not even obeying the commandments of God. Because God at the beginning said that the fear and the dread of you shall be upon the beast of the field. And yet some animals chase you. Although it's because you run after time. And that is the reason why some of us don't want this earth as it is. That is the reason why we found it so easy to buy into the concept of escaping to some place. The Bible says when the Lord comes, we're going to be caught up to meet with him in the skies. But we are also the saints that will descend with him to possess this place. And Jesus says, don't worry about it. He says, behold, I make all things new. Let's not forget whatsoever the Lord does. The Bible says, stands forever. The heavens and the earth, they will stand forever. Someone says, oh, but brother Moses, Jesus says, heaven and earth shall pass away. But not a tittle of the word of God will pass away. Jesus was saying that even as eternal as heaven and earth are, they would have passed away before the word of God passes away. He was just giving us a simile, a, a metaphor. Because when you look out through the Bible, the Bible says there will be a new earth and a new heaven. But Jesus told us clearly how it's going to become new. He says, I will make all things new. He will renew it, but you will still be here. This is it for us. Because we have not even yet seen for one day the original earth that God made before sin came and brought darkness upon everything. The day you open your eyes to see the new earth and to see colors that are beyond what the eye of flesh can see. You know that before Adam fell in the few hours of standing upright in the Garden of Eden, he says, what happened to my eyes? Because once I was able to behold the angels around the throne of the Most High. From the garden, he was able to see the throne. And the Lord said to him, he says, because now your eyes have become the eyes of a beast. The eye, the eye of flesh. So when we receive our new bodies upon the new earth, then you will start to see the beauty of it. You will begin to hear the chorus singing of the mountains. You will be dancing to the clapping of the, of the leaves. When the wind blows, you will hear it call your name and you will hear it appended to the name of your heavenly father. When that day comes, we will see colors that will themselves be a message and a reminder of the love of God beyond the rainbow. We will hear and see things so magnificent. We will sing that song once again, heaven is a place on earth. That time is coming and I am looking forward to seeing it in person because I know it's going to be more glorious when I see it in person than the visions that I have received. It is coming. So what do we do? We have to stand like those trees after the earth has been judged, after the sea has been judged. Let us wait for those winds to come because the winds came for Jesus. The Bible says that the prince of this world came to Jesus and found nothing in him. When the four winds of destruction come upon the earth, they will find nothing in me because I am not made of chaff. I am deeply rooted in the love of the Most High God. And that is the reason why I am called more than a conqueror because of his love for me.
eternal. We will be tested, but we will be standing. We are those trees that will not be uprooted because the Bible says we are the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Come with me to Micah chapter 1 verse 7 and let us break bread with that glorious, beautiful, sweet scripture that we haven't read in two months. Micah chapter 1 verse 7. Sarah is like, is this how this man talks all the time, so fast? Yeah, that's why we record it. So you can go and listen to it again. Yeah, I can. I, I, know, I, know, you were, I know what you were thinking. God is good. R M Mike, M I mean, Micah, not Malachi. Sorry. The Bible says, all her carved images shall be beaten to pieces, and all her pay as a hallowed shall be burned with the fire. All her idols I will lay desolate, for she gathered it from the pay of a hallowed, and they shall return to the pay of a hallowed. Every time that we have prostituted ourselves for material things and how also we have allowed ourselves to lust after the quantity of what somebody has or the quantity or the amount of money that you can have, every one of those times the Lord sees it that we are prostituting our devotion. And he says, you need to give up all those things. Because when the day of reckoning comes, if any one of the idols of God and money are found in your house, you may bear in their judgment. And so I pray for you today that you would allow yourself to love the Lord with all your heart and to not lean on your own understanding. That as we started talking about on Saturday, we are in a season of repentance. A season wherein we're letting go of these false gods. We're letting go of this system, the, the tentacles of the system that are plugged into our flesh. We're unplugging ourselves from the machine. We're unplugging ourselves from the matrix by not letting anything take the place of the Most High God in our lives. We're unplugging ourselves from the system that is already corrupt because we don't need any of its viruses in our system. We want to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts and we want to demonstrate that in our love to other people. The willingness to forgive and the willingness to forget. The willingness to let go of things and hold on to the truth. The willingness to not compromise what we believe because the word of the Lord says it, even though it's not popular with the world. The willingness to say that I am one of the remnant that the Lord is preserving in the land. That is the season that we're in. Do not be caught with the pay of the harlot. And we can repent easily. Because the life of Christ is that glorified life that has been given to you and I. So when you're repenting, what it means is you're allowing yourself to remain in him. Not worrying. Remain in him. Not afraid. Remain in him. Hungering and thirsting after the things of his kingdom. So as we eat of the Lord's body today and drink of his blood, in remembrance of him, I want you to say to yourself, I partake of the Lord. I receive him into me as he has received me into him. In all gratitude, I will serve. In all gratitude, I will obey every word that proceeds from the mouth of my heavenly father so that I do not find myself conforming to this world, but that I always will be transformed by the renewing of my mind, which is godliness, so that I can be holy as my heavenly father is holy. In the mighty name of Jesus, so help us, God. You may eat and drink. So help me, God. You encourage you. I encourage you to say it. Ask for his help. Ask him to help you. In the name of Jesus, you may eat and drink. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. I just want to say a big thank you to... You guys, because I think a month ago, I stood here and I delivered what the Lord put on my heart for us to give sacrificially. And it was the first time that I would make a call like that in over four years of communion house, actually five now, of communion house. And I said that and some, some people came to me afterwards, two people in particular. One of them is here, but I'm not going to look in her direction because she's not shy. And she said, the Lord already told me that this week I'm going to make a sacrificial giving. And so they said that to encourage me because they knew I was somewhat reluctant, but I did it because that was what the Lord said. So I want to say thank you to everyone who's come out and, and given. You know, we're not here hounding people for tithes and offerings. No, the Bible says let everyone give 
as he has proposed in his heart, he or she, not grudgingly nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. My mission is to continue to show to you Christ, the hope of glory, so that you will continually get transformed within you to the point wherein you will cheerfully give in the name of your heavenly Father. You will cheerfully be a part of what the Lord is doing through you and through others so that we, we don't have to be in need of anything. You know, we have been called to be like the early church. And when you read concerning the early church, the Bible says that they sold all that they had and brought the proceeds to the apostles' feet from whence demon distribution was made and none had a lack. The most prosperous body that ever walked the face of the earth was the Ecclesia of Acts. If you go to even the wealthiest nations in the world, you will find somebody who has a need. You will find somebody who lacks something. But the Bible says that that ecclesia, that body did not lack anything. And it was simply because of the generosity of everyone. So I want to encourage you, if you have not so much as made a commitment in your heart to support what we're doing here, I want to encourage you, go ahead. We're a fertile ground here. This ministry in its obedience and by his calling and the love of God is a fertile ground. So I want to encourage you, be a part of what is going on in here. You know, we might be uh, a growing community of people, but we have genuine or what I would call legitimate needs. And so I want to encourage you, it's good to attend, it's good to be a part of, to serve, to listen, to share the word, to spread the word, but it is also needed for us to be those that communicate materially. So I want to encourage you, be a blessing to communion house in the name of the Lord, and you will by no means lose your reward. It's been placed on my heart just very quickly as we were saying that to, to, to read to us 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, verse 19. Thank you, sir. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. The Bible says, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So I, I quoted that scripture, and that's for whoever may be looking for where it is. When I was telling you about the lamb of God, the sacrifice he made, and how pure he was. That life is pure, is without blemish, and that fulfilled all the requirements for your sake. And so have a holy expectation that even you can be without blemish in your character as the Holy Spirit leads you. So if anybody needs an envelope, uh, just wave your hand uh, between Big Mace, that's my brother, Kenyatta, and what, what, what's your name again? Alan. <laughs> they will give you an envelope. Oh, yeah. They will give you an envelope if you need one, but the giving details are about to miraculously appear on the screen. And then we're just going to bless the offering. I'm going to ask Alan once you put that up to come and say what a blessing over the offering and close out the service. But again, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate you all very greatly. One more thing that I'm going to ask of you is try as much as possible to listen to this message ahead of Saturday. Just listen to it again. You see, because one of the things that I have learned is the way by which the Holy Spirit packages me to deliver these messages, there's always more that is being said than is heard one time. You know, the Bible says once was it said, but twice I heard it, that the excellency of power belongs to the Lord. If you want to hear the excellency of the word that has come forth, hear it at least one more time. For you, it is safe, and for me, it is not grievous. God bless you, love you greatly, and I'll see you Saturday. Praise God. God is good. Brother Charles, are you ready? You know we were promised a testimony. How many want to hear of what the Lord has done in our dear brother's life? Sister Barbara, thank you for that encouragement. We're going to welcome our dear brother here, and he's going to share with us what the Lord has done. God is good. I guess I'll keep this short. <laughs> I guess about, okay, as a child, I was very prophetic. I was always having dreams. God was always revealing things to me. And I probably, you know, 
when you're called by the Lord, you know, you kind of, you get shunned by the world. So I would say maybe about middle school, I just kind of turned everything off and just kind of, you know, put that behind me. And when I first came to this ministry, once I saw how Pastor Moses flowed, I thought to myself several times, like maybe if I never would have shut it off, I probably would have been able to have been on that level. So I guess it was about maybe close to a year ago, I guess uh, I went and talked to Pastor Moses about it and told him about a lot of the dreams I used to have. And it was in December I saw he had me and Alan uh, call each other and speak in the pray in the spirit for about 30 minutes to an hour at a time. And uh, going back two weekends ago, you know, he called us up here and he said, if you haven't been hearing anything or, you know, come up here for prayer. So he prayed over me that Saturday. And as far as dreams, I, it was like most nights I will always dream something powerful. And then uh, going into this night, I didn't dream that particular night, but for some reason during the day, that particular Sunday, I was like tired. And for the most part, I only need about three to four hours of sleep a day anyway. I work, I work night shift. So it was about maybe 5 or 5 p.m. on that Sunday, and I was watching a Braves game, and I just laid down, and I went to sleep. And all of you know I'm uh, processing out the military right now. And I had a vision in a dream, and I was kind of up in the clouds, and I was able to see my life from several different perspectives. And it was pretty much showing how everything was pending and how I was about to step into those situations. So it was just kind of a confirmation that I was in the right place. And that was the first time I had like a dream like that, that it, from the Lord in I don't know how many years, you know. I, th I would probably say it was about maybe eight years that I had one. So. Praise God. Let's, oh, here you go. Hey, Charles. So, you know, Charles is a soldier. He just went over it very quickly. But I want to st stress two things. For the sake of those that were also prayed for on the day who may not have seen a full manifestation yet. Don't give up. It was about a year ago, maybe more. A year ago? Yeah, we had moved in here. So almost a year ago, at least more than six months. That you came to me and you said, oh, you used to have dreams when you were little, but you would be scared by your dreams, and so you asked the Lord to take it away, or maybe your mom did or somebody and the dreams went away. And I said, well, but now you want the dreams back, don't you? He said, he wanted the dreams back. And I said to him, connect with this man, because the Bible says that the gifts of God deposited inside of you needs to be stirred up. Deposited by the laying on of hands. Let it be stirred up, because by association, iron sharpens iron. The Bible says, as face answers to face in water, so does the countenance of a man answer to that of his brother. So when someone is already ignited and there's a glow in their lives, if you move close enough to them, you can be ignited because your spirit is a candle. The Bible says the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord with which he searches the innermost parts of his being. How do you light one candle with another? By association, the right kind of association. If evil communication can corrupt good manners, I can tell you good communications can transform lives. You see what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. And so, even though the first time I said, y'all need to be praying together like 30 minutes to an hour, he didn't look too happy. But look at him now. You see what I mean? And so, and he persevered. He will call you, right? He will follow up with you. Y'all will pray together. And I also told him, I said, this thing, you need to study the word. Yeah, last September, study the word, and he would study the word and make notes and show them to me. He would text me what he has read. See, I tell you, there are times wherein the reason why we have not is because we have not made room to receive. God will not give you precious things so that you can throw them out on the street. The Bible says that a man went to sow, a sower went to sow, and the seeds that produced 30, 60, and 100 fold were the ones that fell on a soil that was already prepared. Many of that which is being prophesied over folk in here needs to go hand in hand with preparation. And so this man prepared himself. So I'm not surprised that it was just the next day after I laid hands on him. And what did I say? So some of you will begin to see as you used to see. And in less than 24 hours, 
the man saw, and it was not just something random, it was where he really wanted to have clarity, where he needed it. Because to be processed out of the military, if that's what you've done all your life, you need clarity. Because most of them, or most of the people who have been in the army, are so dedicated that they're not even thinking of what they're going to do afterwards until they come out. And so I praise God for your life, and I just want everyone to see you as an example to other believers of what it means to follow diligently after the things of God. You understand what I mean? Because when God sends you people to tell you stuff, it's not just so that they can say that, huh, huh, I prophesied, or that so you can say, oh, I was prayed over. It is because it's a partnership wherein iron has to sharpen iron. Take that which has been said to you, honor it by running with it, and you will have a testimony in due season. God bless you, Charles. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Father, we give you praise for this time of fellowship, oh God, this night of meeting, oh God, of encouragement, of equipping, of testimony of what you have done, oh God, knowing that you will not leave us nor forsake us, that you are with us, oh God, even until the end of the age. Lord, we give you praise and thank you for this opportunity to partner with this ministry, oh God, that you've set before us in giving and our tithes and our offerings, oh God, giving sacrificially unto the ministry as we see the ones that you have set before us. But Lord, we know that you bring increase, you bring multiplication. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord. God is good. Two, two announcements for us tomorrow. Uh, as usual, Wednesday, 9 p.m. on Instagram, we'll be praying. Please uh, tap into that. And my fellas, I see you, sir. I see you. I see pastor. This Saturday, no, I'm sorry, Sunday. My brother Chris is not in here. He's with the baby. Golf, men's golf. We back at it. Look, I think we done started a trend, okay? So wives, let your husbands come fellowship with the brothers. You know, we're going to have a good time. <laughs> We're going to have a good time come Sunday. If you don't have those details, come find me. Bro, do you play? You need to come play with us. Come, come lock in with me, bro, and we'll go from there. Everyone have a blessed night.